All right, everybody, welcome. This is CyberBulls. Today we have a very special guest. It's James from Invest Answers. James has his own YouTube channel called Invest Answers, and he does a lot of financial modeling, not only Tesla, but also a lot of other stocks. So James, first question for you is, is there money flowing out of Tesla and into the Mag7 and specifically Nvidia? How do you see the broader market happening and where's Tesla's position in all this? We're in at the deep end. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> Just jump right in. So honored to be here. And it's so funny. I've met everybody here face to face with the exception of you, Herbert. I know. So and I've been on your channel too, but I love this group. Great people. Uh, it, it's weird. I haven't tracked a lot of money flow lately. And I do look at money flow into assets a lot because that can be very indicative of where things are going. I do know that Kathy Wood is buying almost every single day. Um, but that's what she does, and she's doing the right thing. There are some people, as you know, out there who are kind of losing faith in Tesla somehow. Um, you know, longstanding bulls, you've got, I can't remember the guy's name, uh, who wanted to be on the board. I don't, Ross you know, Gerber. Ross yeah. Gerber. You know, he's, he's, he has an axe to grind right now. Um, so there's um, a lot of weird stuff going on. I think right now, considering all the lines of business, all the value, all the stuff that they have on the roadmap, the the way they operate, it's only a matter of time before Wall Street wakes up, takes out their pencils, puts two and two together and says, wow, we need to be an AI. And this is the number one AI play. But that penny has not dropped yet. It's only a matter of time before it will. Now, when you look at the relative valuation of other assets, like you mentioned NVIDIA, NVIDIA is at a valuation right now, which is pretty scary. Uh, and there's a couple of things happening with that. One, I think if you forecast out two, three years, it's very fairly valued. If you look at it today, it's valued at a PE of, I think, 366, which is insane. You compare that to Tesla, it's only a matter of time before people that run money will start rotating out of the frothy AI assets and into the cheaper ones. When that happens, I don't know, but sometime in the next 12 to 18 months, I think it'll definitely probably happen, we hope. And uh, it's just, it's a sad time as well with Tesla right now when you see the fact that it's under the price it was over three years ago, but the roadmap has come so far and the products, the features, the functionality, it's insane. And when you look at how the competition is dealing with Tesla, it has no competition. And you look at the mega bike business growing so fast as there's nothing but tailwinds, but I think because of their lack of 2024 guidance, it got dinged hard. But I always look at things as an opportunity. And this is a very undervalued asset for what it is right now. So if you can DCA your stack, it's probably worth it, not financial advice. The company and the product don't look at the quarterly stock movement. As a trader, I got to take them off the table and wait for a better price. A very realistic bull, questioning certain decisions. The rational bull, I enjoy listening to bears. They're looking for the red flags. You're supposed to react. So this term, MAG7, right? I mean, we know it's a coin term. Jim Cramer first initially came up with uh, the FANG stocks. I never liked that name. Now it's the MAG7 because in the first quarter, what, first half of last year, it was all these seven uh, stocks were taking care of the, you know, the market primarily. It's now expanded. People are now calling it the MAG6, trying to kick Tesla out. Uh, how do you see, what do you feel about that concept? I think everybody has an ax to grind. Um, if you listen to anything Kramer says, you know he's skewed because of his foundation in Ford. Uh, it's kind of like some of the analysts whose fathers worked at General Motors. You just have to ignore all of that noise. I think, if anything, there should be something called the Magnificent One, and that would be Tesla. But I am obviously a Tesla bull, but I play the long game into disruption. That's kind of what I've always done in my life. Try weed out where things are happening now. If you, one of the things that I like to say a lot, I got into Tesla first hard in 2017. And if you had told me what they were doing today, back in 2017, I would have said you were nuts. It's impossible to do all that stuff, deliver all that stuff, have the energy business and the bot and everything else, FSD where it is today. Um, so from that perspective, it's just noise. Everybody is coming after Elon Musk. Everybody's coming after Tesla because they threaten everything, whether you are traditional media like Wall Street Journal or CNBC, or if you are a global telco provider, you're threatened by Starlink. If you are a manufacturer of anything, you are threatened by Tesla. 
uh, I mean, the hits keep coming. Utilities, oil companies, everybody's threatening by, by him. So that's my perspective. He's the persona non grata, but he's also the most important, important person on the planet today, in my opinion. Nice. Alexandra? Yeah, that's well said. Um, you're completely on, on spot, James, because, um, I mean, I don't care about Max 7. I don't actually care about indices. As you know, I think it's just crazy that the whole market moves because some guy sat in an office in New York and put an index together and then can decide who can back get into the index and who is going to be thrown out and how arbitrary it is. It would be just math. It's one thing, but it's not. So um, Max 7, Max 6, uh, Tesla in, Tesla out doesn't give me any uh, comfort nor no grievance. Um, but, it, but it is true that um, Tesla investors have the whole world against them. You're completely right, uh, James. Tesla and the other Musk economy companies put everybody under pressure. He's disrupting everything. We're on the same time in a very disruptive market environment where, where just so much is moving on one side to AI, on the other side uh, to um, autonomous cars. Th th so many things happening at the same time. It all makes sense within Tesla, but it doesn't make sense to a lot of other people. And all they feel is the stress that comes from it. So I don't know whether you followed it the last three months. Lots of journalists got made redundant. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, LA Times. I mean, people that, that really had a beef with Elon for a long time and are suddenly uh, unemployed. So this whole situation only gets worse. Example yesterday. Yesterday, Bloomberg made an article about, oh, apparently some people in Tesla told them uh, that they should... Um, do a list who is indispensable and who is not within each team. Tesla does this every year. Since I follow Tesla for four years now, every year this comes out January, February, and that is just you know normal housekeeping in a company where you want to make sure the teams rest, uh, remain focused and 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 harmonious, and you don't have you know laggers in there, and want to make sure everybody is motivated. That's what you do. The same day I went on Tesla's career job uh, opportunity site. And there are 112 jobs in the AI and uh, and bot sector. Um, there are 37 jobs in the dojo sector. There are jobs all over the world for, for all and anything. So, but the story obviously that had to get out is Tesla is closing tomorrow, right? And and they manipulated charts to make it look. <laughs> I mean, it was crazy. Just you know, third derivative just to make it look negative. But all that to say. It is what it is. It's always been the stock where the most FUD has hit. I'm, I'm not talking about AMC and a couple of other ones that are that are um, that were in the same league. But of the big ones, this is this is what it is. We just have to fight it. And then what comes to it, and I think we're going to address this a bit later, is the community on X seems to split up a little bit. Some people seem to be fed up with it, and uh, and I think that's making the whole thing a little bit more tragic than usual. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned media actually had a slide put together for another presentation and just to highlight exactly how much traditional media was gutted mm -hmm. look at all these names uh, buzzfeed insider local newsrooms all over the country vice paper magazine vox mm -hmm. i never heard of complex sports illustrated i don't know what that is to media national Grid. i mean it has been absolutely brutal for traditional media now when you have a guy like elon musk Cutting your core business, are they going to write good press about you? The answer is no. So, it's yeah. uh, very well said. Yeah, Jeff, yeah. did you want to jump in? Yeah, well, I mean, it, I mean, the points that Alexander and James made, I think, are spot on. I'm a long term investor since 2012. I will take a little bit of a, uh, I'll take another little bit of a shift on it, though. I think a lot of this depends on time horizon uh, in terms of uh, how. In, you talk about the investing behavior right now in the markets and Tesla and the Mac seven, a lot of this depends on time horizon. And, you know, if you have a very short time horizon and you need capital or you need to compound your capital, uh, Tesla has been a mixed bag. It hasn't been all bad. The last three years, the last five years has been tremendous. The last 10 years, it's been tremendous. You, nobody should be really complaining if you have that long of horizon, but if you're somebody who is, who either need some exit liquidity or you need to compound your capital every so often, uh, the last three years have been uh, tough in most parts. Uh, and, and, it, and I think what's concerning people is that the company is doing so many things so well, but it feels like there's a lid or you know, they're not living up to like their full, 
like their full potential. Like they could be even doing, you know, greater things or they could be communicating what they're doing more effectively. I'm not talking about advertising per se, but it's just like how the, how the, the earnings calls are, are managed. Like the more important stuff is what happens the 89 days, you know, uh, you know, outside of an earnings call and they, they get all that stuff, right. In fact, they have the best supply chain, I think in the world, to be honest with you, I'm not, I don't throw that term out, um, lightly given my background, they, they have, and Gartner's rated them the best auto supply chain, uh, in the world. They don't even talk about it. And, uh, it, that means they're managing cash. They're managing inventory. They have, uh, they have supply continuity. They have supply redundancy. They have uh, localization of their factories. They have localization of their source of supply. And they have network latency that's lower than, than anybody that's basically building uh, vehicles today. And the metrics show it. And, in, and that type of horsepower is w when, when, you know, when, when things start going on this massive growth trajectory again as rates get cut. And this, we're, we're in within a year of all this stuff happening. Uh, who's going to emerge with a supply uh, what the strength of that supply chain, the speed of their supply chain, and who's got the product line, as James was mentioning, uh, to serve those markets when you see the others pulling back. So I think there could be a little bit of a frustration of like, well, Tesla could be actually doing better. But if you look at their multiple, if you just do it on a, and this is this goes back to the other age old question, how do you value Tesla? Uh, how do you even value uh, NVIDIA? They keep outstripping. Every time there's an earnings report on NVIDIA, they invalidate you know the prior you know, forwards earning view for forward earnings view pretty radically because of their beat and raise. And I think that's where a lot of people get caught up. The easier story is come on an earnings call, be top line, be top, be bottom line, give a good outlook. And, you know, you know, and then the, the analyst community, everybody pats you on the back and you're, and you're good to go. Tesla is not telling a good story. They're not managing a good story in that environment. But again, the other 89 days, they have the best EV lineup. They have the best auto lineup in the world. They have the number one selling car in the world. They have the best supply chain in the world. They have the best software technology and capability in the world. They have arguably the best real world AI technology. We keep going back and forth on these debates. But when I sit in, in front of various language models and use them, and when I sit in front of my vehicle operating you know, Tesla's AI solution with FSD, I have a much better experience and a much more reliable experience using tesla ai in the real world than these language models that are getting these you know very large multiples so i think when you package it all together i have a little bit of a different shift i think it's time horizon based i think there's people that have 10-year <clears throat> time horizons they're like you know let it go low let it go high i don't care and then you have people that need exit liquidity or they want to compound on a yearly basis and it's uh you know it's a struggle for them so i think there's different strokes for different folks that's how it is um, and you know, we're going to talk a little bit later about, the, about the community and access Alexander talked about, but I think that's ultimately the situation and there's not one answer I can give you that would make everybody happy or make everybody like, you know, nod their head because everybody's kind of got a different, you know, a different time horizon on, on, on what they need. Did not like the different strokes of different folks. Um, I, inv I interviewed James, and James, you had a very unique way to value Tesla, as J as Jeff was just talking about. Do you want to just share a little bit of uh, your thinking about that? Yeah, so um, it, it's funny because almost every month or every quarter, you turn around and there's a new business model that you never even anticipated. Now they're selling hardware for chargers for hotels and uh, oil companies that are trying to pivot their gas stations to charging stations. So yeah, now, right now, I think I'm at 12 different lines of business. Each one, this is the crazy thing. Each one of was valued standalone would be, you know, at least a $300 billion corporation, some already a trillion dollars. And the sum of the parts far exceeds the market cap today, which is insane. But um, and we can we can dig into that and, and talk about some of those in a little while. But I've always wanted to pick Jeff Letts's mind because he, he, what you understand about manufacturing is far beyond what anybody ever would on YouTube. And what upset what obsessed me is, I remember years ago I heard they build their own CRM system and analytics system, uh, yeah. supply chain system, etc. All into one. I think I could be wrong. I think it's called Tesla One. But all of the Elon Musk businesses have this back end, and it supports their agile manufacturing system. They pull in, I can't remember the exact numbers, 1 million automated tests per second 
from their vehicles yeah. Yeah. and they can tell you exactly where the seat positions are uh what the car is doing how the motors are running if they're hot they're cold how much energy they're putting out how much energy they're burning all that type of stuff this integrated and there's another thing as well and i'm out of my league here but they can specify for supply chain what they need in very short windows of time like 24 hours so they can keep enhancing and developing not only for themselves but with their supply chain too i think this itself how they manage that whole area of the business doesn't even have a dollar value on it and it unto itself is worth trillions for all the industries around the world would you mind jeff taking two minutes to talk about that because people really don't get that yeah i mean these could you know i could do five different sections and five different individual shows about uh their approach to manufacturing tech the manufacturing technology in the factory their approach to inventory and network latency like these are all like you know could be one hour shows where, you know you go back and forth on it but what i had a conversation today with a with a fund manager i, I was very blunt i'm just like you guys really you you don't you you give the the tesla supply chain basically a zero valuation and when you actually look at at how it performed during the pandemic and how it just performs every quarter um it's actually a tremendous value to the company and you give it a zero and yeah some of the comments you bought in terms of their own what basically what they do is you have the as a as a manufacturer you there's technology that you need in your factory to run a shop floor and to understand where product is to understand um a, the flow of product, the manufacturing instructions, the actual integrated test of the product in the factory. There's all things where you could buy these solutions or you could develop them yourself. And Tesla's taken a, mo a motive. They they still they do externally source solutions, but in general, their their mode is to make it themselves and then not have to per pay perpetual licenses uh, to providers to do this. And what this allows them to do allows them to tailor fit. And this is the whole conversation I've had about in, uh, NVIDIA as a silicon supplier in FSD versus Tesla and having that end-to-end -end solution. They have this end-to-end -end solution in manufacturing. So it allows them to bring up factories quicker. It allows them to cut and paste faster. It allows them to coordinate and, uh, and, uh, um, and calibrate themselves within their factories to each other so they get similar results. You get great build quality and you understand if you have any deviation and allows them to move material back and forth between them. What does all this mean? This means that yeah, this means that they have supply availability. They have a, 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 the velocity of money in terms of bringing inventory in and product out the other end is faster than anybody else that does it. And when you do that, it, you, what it, it has tremendous value to your cash balances throughout the quarter. But what it allows you to do is it allows you to convert that cash faster than anybody else that's building the same product. So when you have a COGS reduction idea, if Drew has this idea of I want to combine these two parts together, in Tesla, they have the inbound lead time for the part, they have they have the the the, the short assembly time, and they have 15 days of inventory. That same chain, that's probably a 25 to 35 day chain, depending on the part for Tesla. That same chain for legacy automakers for EV is probably six months to eight months. And so when people think, well, how are they doing these cogs reductions? How are they doing all these things? It's the way that their supply chain is designed. Like I said, this could be a very long show. I can go into a number of different points in detail, but it gets a zero from the analyst community. And I, I was just talking like this Baird uh, visit to the Fremont factory. Look at the feedback from that. There's nothing about like, hey, we asked some questions about, you know, how's the old Model 3, uh, you know, in terms of uh, manufacturing and velocity and, and and production efficiency versus the uh, the new Model 3? Like, what are those? None of this stuff comes up because they don't have this capability in that community. They should really, they should really acquire it, to be honest with you, because I think you can get some alpha <clears throat> understanding, you know, Tesla's capability here relative to others. Yeah. Hey, Xander, you want to jump in? Uh yeah, I mean, some thoughts I had was, uh, first of all, I love that uh, bull in, in James's background. Uh, and, and love the background. It was great seeing you at, uh, at the launch event. Um, the, well, are we talking about the MAG-6, MAG-7 question? Yeah. It's up to you. Yeah, do you want to answer anything? Uh, or? 
I'm going to ask him a question. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I think a lot of it was covered. Uh, you know, the, the big thing for me is, you, you know, you keep hearing, look at, compare Tesla uh, three years uh, to whatever, S&P. That's like such a cherry pick data point because, as Jeff said, you go back five years and that, that argument completely breaks down. So I, I don't uh, pay too much mind to, to, to these short term uh, you know, cherry pick data points, but uh, it really, it's a, it's an, it's a impatience that that people have. This is not a company that is a, uh, you know, b- built out. It's mature. It's uh, throwing off distributions, and you're just you're just sitting back and collecting your your uh, you know predetermined paycheck. It, it's it's really your if you're investing into innovation. The point that uh, was being made regarding. AI and all these companies and the magnificent seven that are uh, going in the AI direction and they have, uh, you know, R and D budgets that are very large uh, being applied to this is the question becomes is who's who's going to monetize it the best, not today but in five years, in ten years. So I, I think that that's what disruption looks like, and you know, ultimately Elon um, is being equated as Tesla, especially on X, and the community is getting uh, very impatient regarding it. But in in my mind, Elon posts aren't equal to Tesla's management guidance, where uh, some people are looking at it that way. So, uh, you know, he's he's the villain. And uh, until he becomes the hero, uh, unfortunately, it's going to kind of pull Tesla down, uh, because that's the that's the net result of, uh, you know, disrupting. Uh, as James s- said, uh, when you're when you're disrupting everything from oil to media to insurance to a- every every segment that they're going after. And uh, so I, I just uh, I, I kind of focus on that. And you know, yeah, you could call it the Mag Six. I I, I really don't care. Um, but uh, there are things that are. Uh, short term that I do focus on from the technicals and maybe we'll we'll uh, talk about the stock later but uh, uh, that's that's what I think about the max okay. so there are uh, we just covered the mag 7 topic let's talk about the Tesla sentiment as you brought up there um, Xander as well as the Elon effect the things you just said there so uh, let's th- start with you James I mean what's going on there seems to be this uh, split amongst the Tesla community long-term bulls some people are, uh, I like you. I think somebody brought it up earlier, right? Losing faith in Tesla at this moment. Others are uh, just very upset with Elon. We can reserve that for the next uh, topic. But what's your thinking and what's going on with the um, Tesla investor community? Well, it's uh, I think a big part of it is human nature. Humans don't like losing money, and maybe there were latecomers to the Tesla story, and they bought the top. And they hear all this goodness, but it's not reflected in stock price. So they get very upset. They get very impatient. So my uh, investing style is find disruption, uh, get in early, get in hard, as they always say, and then have a methodology. When you see things go way beyond negative standard deviations, you layer in much harder. So just recently, I added probably about 5% to my Tesla position, which is quite large. And uh, once it was at 180 and then 175 or 176 just a couple weeks ago. So I wait for these opportune moments to buy. But the people that are upset are the people that probably bought at 400 or 300. And they've heard it's going to the moon, but it's not there. And that is what pains people. But the sad thing is, and this is, this is again, a weakness of humans, somehow when the pain gets to a certain level, they sell at exactly the wrong time. <laughs> like yeah. they, they nail bottoms, literally. Absolutely. But not, not from a buying perspective, from a selling perspective. It's, and I, am, I have for thir- over 35 years, I've been obsessed with the mind and how the mind works. Because if you can control this, you can be successful in the markets. If you let emotions control your decision-making, you're toast. And there was one, one guy, I remember, I was literally considering a jokey i always jokingly say selling organs when it went to 104 106 i was just ditching everything and going into I, and i do something i that i never do is buy out of the money call options for nothing because i wanted to maximize my return um and then at the same time you got people selling and i heard that guy just sold again today or yesterday he got out of tesla completely again nailing the bottom he nailed it at 106 
He nailed it again at 180. So it's just, I, I urge people to do what Jeff said, have that really study, study the asset, study the potential, study where the world is going. The world will be a dramatically different place in two years. Um, as Shamath said, AI will be 1600 times better in two or three years. Can you imagine? what Tesla will be doing in two or three years. And that's what people can't wrap their heads around is the exponentiality of this opportunity. So just my two cents on that. And Alexandra, I saw you nod when I talked about the psychology of <laughs> I investing. Did. I did because because actually I had this moment, I remember very well, I think it was October or beginning of November, 2022, when the stocks, you know, when, when Elon sold again. Remember he initially sold, we understood why he initially sold and then he sold again and then he sold again. And, uh, and and I shared this already on the cyber balls, but I just want to recall it. So I had this sleepless night. I always sleep. I need my sleep. But this was one that, you know, I was going on and on in my head about, you know, should I stay in the stock? At that point, I was losing money for the first time. I hadn't lost money up to, I think, down to 130. But but that was really the moment where, where I started to, you know, I would found, find my money back. But if it was going lower, I would lose money. And um, and so for a night, I was really thinking this through all the opportunities of of Tesla, and I was emotional. It wasn't in a calm state because usually I'm, you know, we're all trained to be analysts and calm and look at that. But I was like, okay, enough, enough of these promises that don't materialize, these timelines that don't get where we want to get, and whatever. And I said, okay, calm down, calm down. So what is it? It's energy. It's the cars. It's going to be the bots later. It's going to be Dojo, and. It took me a while to really, you know, get to the point where I thought, you know what, it doesn't matter what Elon does. What Elon has done to Tesla is enough, is 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 perfect, and he will do it again, and you will have just, you know, have the faith to get over it. And that moment became really the click where I said, okay, don't worry. Just don't worry. It may go down a little bit further. It may go up again. doesn't matter. Your horizon is, and it, it still is, but 10 years out, what do you worry about? There's going to be your fear of missing out, Alexandra, is going to be so much bigger and your regret of having gone out now. And then once I've digested that, that was it. And since then, it you know, it doesn't get to me. But I think everybody has to do that homework, understand of you know how much risk you want to take. I'm not saying people shouldn't do margin or shouldn't do options. Elon told us not to do it. He told it a couple of times. So if people would have listened then, maybe they wouldn't have been in the in the issues they were, but that's just the way it is. It's not my role to tell people, but if you have, if you have that, you know, trader mentality and you want to play with with your money, then you know, admit you want to play with your money. Don't blame it on Elon, don't blame it on Tesla, don't blame it on I don't know what. And so, so the come clean with what your horizon is, come clean what your objectives are, come clean how much you're prepared to lose, and then get the emotion out of it. That that's just the whole the whole game. And lots of people don't do it. They they see a headline and get into a stock they've hardly done their homework with. I'm not even talking only about Tesla. I mean, I'm, I'm sure today people are crying over PayPal. PayPal at one moment was at seven, uh, at 300, is now at, at 50, 54. I don't know how much it is. Alibaba was at 300, is now at 70. So there's lots of stocks where people really thought this was it and, and, and lost money. Before you get into any stock, do your homework. Think how long you have to, until, until you need to get out. Think how much you risk you want to add to it. And if you can stomach that, then do it. But if you can't stomach it, well, then go in treasury bill, uh, bills or do something else and, and live your life because it's short enough for all of us. So may as well have a good time. Yes, that's very yeah. well said. I want to piggyback on that real quick. Uh, it, you know, I'm reminded of Warren Buffett's, you know, you own a farm. You, you, so in, in this case, we bought a production line. Um, don't check the stock price every day. You know, if your investing thesis is to, uh, you know, be in it for five years, then that's that's what you you know you you purchased it. It's just the same thing with a, with a car or any asset that you buy. You're not going to keep going back on. Oh, did I overpay? Did I overpay? Um, 
And, you know, there's a lot of people that now, uh, what you said about uh, mistiming it and they sell the exact bottom, James, you know, now we're, we're hearing, I'm hearing people saying, oh, I'll, I'll never touch leaps again. And I'm like, well, technically you're supposed to go down in stock, but up in leaps. That's like, that's how you move forward if you're trying to, obviously not 100% of your portfolio, but, you know, something you're willing to lose like 10% or uh, something reasonable. And, but people get burned by the stove. They don't learn the lessons and they just continue to make in that same mistake take over and over and over again yeah, yeah exactly so i think it goes goes back to alexander's comment it's a personal introspective decision and there's not one answer you're going to get from you should get from any of us i i've always been against you know giving financial advice you know elon's saying don't get into margin and if you short term it's a problem at 140 to 160 it doubled uh after that so i mean if you would have plunked whatever amount down you would have double your money uh with whatever vehicle you wanted you know wanted to use in terms of investing so you really it's it's that personal introspective look of like what what can you deal with what's your time horizon when do you need access to your capital what's your goal for your capital do you want to compound it at greater than the s p every year well then if you have a specific goal for that then you've got to you know design a specific portfolio uh to meet that but I can't tell you stay in Tesla, sell Tesla, buy more Tesla here. I don't know where the stock's going to go tomorrow. Nobody knows. Uh, where, and then people at you know prognosticating like why the stock is down this morning, why it's up at night, or why nobody really knows. You can. There's so many people trading this stock. It's a heavily, heavily traded uh, security. There's so many people in it. It's really hard to understand, you know, one thing or another. But that's where you have to go back to the fundamentals of the company. Like, what are you buying? That's what Xander's saying. Like, what are you? Mm -hmm. What are you yeah. ultimately buying? Can I jump on that? Because that's exactly my point, that I think people don't know what Tesla is or they made a mistake thinking they knew what Tesla is. Uh, I am with you, James. I think Tesla is a disruptive technology. If you recognize it as a disruptive technology, then you know that the existing um, environment, the existing competitive landscape is going to be completely turned over. But before it is turned over, you normally see the existing uh, legacy companies, the incumbents, they continue to increase their profit, increase revenue, increase sales until the moment you know that that uh, it just crosses over and then it just immediately uh, just complete falls off a cliff. People don't realize that. And so they're buying Tesla thinking that it's a car company, that they've created an electric vehicle, that this electric vehicle start to sell in mass. So now I'm gonna calculate how many sales, oh wait, they're, they're telling me it's 50% growth every year. Uh oh, it's only 35% growth this year. Stock price is going down. Er, what, they, they told me I was gonna get 30% margin every year. Now it's 20%. Why did they cut the prices? That's not what this is. This is Amazon and they were losing money, but were they just a book company? If you recognize as a book company, you're going, okay, let me take a look at all the uh, bookstores out there and Barnes and Noble, and uh, they have all these retail stores. Come on, Amazon, why don't you build retail stores? But if you knew that this wasn't a book company and it was a disruptive technology, you were able to stomach the you know, Amazon.bomb, Amazon.toast era where there was zero profit. But the reason why there was zero profit was they kept throwing the money in into the disruptive technology. And it was way more than just books, right? It was the e-commerce site, it was the supply chain, it was the delivery and, and then the programs that they put out. So mm -hmm. in a disruptive technology, it is going to be, uh, it's not straight up in terms of stock price, in terms, in terms of uh, all the metrics, but every single day you're seeing electric vehicles take over, but it's not just electric vehicles, right? We're not talking about all these innovations that they're doing and it will happen at one moment. The cliff will fall on the legacy and that's what you're waiting for. In the meantime, it's you're gonna see the legacies continue to rise. Like we're seeing, you know, how come Ford, how come GM's profit is going up? <laughs> And I'm listening to, right? We had this great conversation with, uh, you know, an, a lot, well, let's just not name names, but an analyst just a few days ago saying, can't you see GM and Ford are just doing incredibly well? Uh, <laughs> I guess you're not understanding that there's going to be a, do you not agree with me that in a moment, maybe three years, maybe five years, maybe seven years, but ICE vehicles is dead and it's going to happen very, very, it's going to be like this and then boom, it's going to fall flat fast. And if you don't get that, then you're investing in the wrong company. As I always say, risk happens fast. I'm so glad you mentioned Amazon. If I'm talking too much, let me know. But no, if you no. go back to Steve, to Jeff Bezos, I was going to say Steve yeah. Jobs for a second. 
both amazing individuals. May Steve rest in peace. You go back to Amazon when the price fell from 110 or 115 dollars down to six bucks. And it was there. And Jeff, yeah, I was there too. And Jeff Bezos is looking at all his metrics. Every metric is exploding upwards, and is like, hmm. What's going on with the stock prices? Like things are great, and uh, you know, he just kept his nose down, pedal on the metal. And there's one little chart I do want to show because this is probably what's going to happen to Tesla. I just don't know when, but uh, this little puppy here, uh, name that tune. That is what it did over the last year. So if it's popping up there for you, straight up, and the blue is the trend. The trend was never broken. And in fact, you could argue based on this chart, it's only accelerating as it goes up. Obviously, it's not a log chart. But that is what will happen to Tesla one day, maybe 2025, maybe late this year, maybe 2026 at the latest. But that is your runway to what I call stack, you know, layer into these asymmetric bets, because you know, yeah, like what we talked about Tesla one, nobody can touch them. And Jeff will attest that nobody has the manufacturing prowess. Nobody has the supply chain prowess. Nobody has the data. Nobody has built an OS for a car from the ground up where you can tweak anything. And the big joke was the, uh, the NHTSA recall on the brake light font size. <laughs> why, why, why did they go to Tesla? Because no other company in the world can actually modify that on the fly, you know? And then the mainstream media grabs hold of it and rips it apart. It's like, oh my God, they're doomed. They got to pull in 5 million cars. It's like, and the problem is, you know, we're in the bubble. So we know what's going on. Nobody else does. They see the headline. They think, uh oh, mm -hmm. I'm ditching my Tesla stock. And that's exactly what the media companies want. But that is an opportunity. You get to buy Tesla 175 bucks. It's like last year all over again. So my take. How low do you think it's going to go, James? What's your, uh, what's, are we the bottom that you were saying? No, I think, I think, and looking at all the metrics, I think there's a couple of earnings surprises in store. The energy business could hit that 20% tipping point. I'd like to pick your brains on that. That's 25% plus margin. That will bring up the margins. You have the Cybertruck ramping up. They could be doing 150, 170,000 of these this year. They're high margin vehicles and they're selling them 120K wow. a pop. FSD uptake, I don't know. It depends on 12 dot whatever comes out. That could be a big uplift to margins. And then, you know, they did mention Model 2, but Wall Street won't take any action until they see it on the road and they know how much it costs and how much they can make. Um, but there are potentially a few 2024 surprises. And I just scratched the surface. Jeff, what do you think? I, I've often said that this Q1 print could be a surprise. Last year, I was saying like in the second half of the year, there'll probably be a surprise on gross margin COGS, and there was. They had sequential improvement in gross margin in COGS in Q4. This quarter right now is is setting up potentially for them to do that again. I'm you know I'm getting all kinds of blowback on X about it and and folks modeling this. By the way, this is something that you have to think about. This is very this is hard for Tesla to model, by the way. Tesla doesn't know this is one of the reasons they're not they're not guiding with any great accuracy on this is because COGS are very difficult uh, to model, but I think they could surprise in Q1, um, you know, possibly on gross margins again, you know, favorably, maybe on units as well. Um, but I think that could be the first point of a surprise. There could be energy out there coming to, maybe they held some back in Q4. It's very lumpy. Um, but I'm not expecting a surprise on the cyber truck this year. I've always pinned them somewhere between 70 and 80,000 units this year maybe they could it, it's going to be non-linear because they've installed a lot of the capacity and they have to solve these problems that they have in front of them the reason they're not you know at full capacity is it takes a time it takes time to get there but they have a set of problems in front of them i know they have to solve so uh it could be a little bit non-linear the thing that could go non-linear pretty quickly is not so much fsd 12 but fsd going wide uh, geographically but more importantly, after it goes wide, I think Tesla then would be more open to pursuing licensing agreements. I know we got an unfavorable response on the first quarter call. There's no reason for me to think that there's anything better going on than what Elon said. But I also think it's something that 
as the maturity of it improves, uh, that you know it, it can happen very quickly. Both the improvement in FSD 12 can happen very quickly now that it's you know it's video in control out, and I also think being approached for licensing could happen quickly when people you know can now see the performance of it. This is a thing that people understand, and I've actually visited some competitive um, um, OEMs over the past couple of years and I walk in there and I'll go into their garage and we'll have a conversation and I'll look, I'm like, Oh, you've got 12 Teslas here. They're like, yep. They're tearing them apart. They're looking at them from a cost structure perspective and they're looking at them from an FSD uh, perspective and they're doing, they're all benchmarking Tesla and everybody kind of buys everybody else's stuff. That's not uncommon, but I don't think people realize how heavily benchmarked and how heavily, Tesla's being looked at. That's why I think the licensing thing could happen uh, sooner um, yeah. and, and, and more abruptly. And I would like to add to that, that, you know, yesterday when, was it yesterday that Ford gave their results or the day before? Anyway, I'm, I'm losing. So they explained that they're doing a small shop independently to, to develop EV. Good for them but certainly not with FSD. I mean, I know they have their models out there, but that actually gave me hope again that that uh, this new side business that they're developing independently from, from the big corporation um, is going to be the first the first uh, plug-in client for, um, for assisted driver or even already FSD of Tesla. Excellent. And uh, when people talk about things like forward guidance, one one point that a lot of people miss too is this. Like we did kick it off at the beginning, talking about 13 different lines of business. But what Tesla's doing is they are building, they are investing, they are creating, they are inventing mm -hmm. all of these things all at the same time. And I was on with Sir and Basher there last week, and you know, the auto bidder stuff. He's modeled that out. We put that into this model too. And that itself is huge, along with mega packs, along with FSD and bots and superchargers and hardware and dojo and insurance and AI inference and robotaxi and semi. I mean, it's insane. So uh, back to Jeff, how the, how the, how can you guide the capex of this? And where it's all going to go when you're investing so much and you're doing it in such a lean and mean manner. that That's the big piece that Wall Street's completely missing. They don't even know this 13 lines of business. And there could be 14 tomorrow. Yeah. Like I said, Tesla gets a zero for supply chain efficiency. They also pretty much get a zero for R&D efficiency. Uh, and it's such an important metric. Alexander calls it out all the time. Larry calls it out. Uh, and I'm I'm telling you from... I've worked with, I don't want to name any of the companies, but a lot of mega cap companies in the past. And I've been, you know, embedded in their operation. And I see what, you know, Tesla is doing and how they manage CapEx and how they manage R&D efforts. And I, I, I believe it's, it looks like it's night and day. Uh, and, you know, can, can someone catch up uh, potentially in some of these efficiency metrics, but they're so far out ahead. So how do you forecast their cap? I mean, they forecast their CapEx. You know, could they go in and interrupt? I think it's going to become more difficult as those 13 lines of businesses mature and or if they add more. Um, I think it is going to be a little bit more <clears throat> difficult to to put a number on that. And uh, and that's what's feeding the, you know, could they do a capital raise, right? That's what's feeding a lot of, a lot of that. But um, in terms of efficiency, <clears throat> you think about you're giving, like as Andrew said, you're buying a piece of their factory. We're also investing, like when they invest R&D dollars, you're, you're investing with that company that's investing R&D dollars and your dollar goes much farther with, and the data this is what the data says. Every dollar invested in R&D produces X percent of sales. Your dollars go farther. So it's not translating into the EPS. This is the cold hard facts. The cold hard facts are 2021 to 2022 to 2023 EPS is down three years in a row. <clears throat> but now you have to look at like, what's your time horizon? What's your perspective? What are these, what's the time horizon on these investments? And then you've got to, you know, you've got to articulate when you need money. Can you, can you wait it out? And if you look at the timeline of these investments, it, it, the answer would be is you wait for them to come to fruition because they're so efficient with their investing. 
Yeah, and instead of earnings per share, right? What I look at instead of like how much money do they put in R&D is the rate of innovation. And so you took a look and every three months they announced something new, right? There's the 48 volt architecture that just all of a sudden came out and said, we were doing this. They're doing the unbox model. They've got robots now that's gonna come to fruition in a year to or two. You know, every quarter there's something brand new that they've been working on and it comes out. Does that translate to earnings per share? No, but it will when it all comes together and then it's not just like a linear thing, it's gonna be an exponential shot shot up. And so every time they just keep telling you that they're innovating and they keep producing innovative products and the solutions that's gonna impact everything. We're talking like impacting margins significantly once you have the bots in place, like in mass numbers. Where's that in your 10 year spreadsheet? Those people who are creating these spreadsheets, have you, you're gonna discount it to nothing and then you think that margins are going to just grow by a certain 10, 20 percent growth each year because of cost of goods reduction. Well, what happens when you've got, you know, all the entire workforce is all automated and, and that's where they're headed. And you can see you, you can't deny it. Right. The Tesla is actually showing you that every quarter they're introducing new processes that improves everything like they were the first to do. Um, the the giga hassings was five years ago while everybody else was still twiddling their thumbs. So it's it's like these things add up and then they end up showing up. Yeah. And the, and the 13 lines of business we saw all kind of feed off on each other one way or another. And if you look at everything that Tesla does, nothing is mm. by chance. Everything is part of a long-term plan. Why 48 volt? My theory is they need enough power juice in the system to do steer by wire. That's yeah. it. And then it, the reason yeah, why they're doing steer by wire taxi. is... Yeah, because you can't do the unbox yeah. model, and then you can then do robo taxi. Yeah, yeah, and and so much other stuff. And 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 I spent some time on Sand Hill Road, uh, Silicon Valley, where all the VCs are, and they they know they go into a deal. They know nine will lose, one will hopefully will make it, and more than make up for the nine that lose. But you look at this portfolio of thirteen. Name me one that may not mm -hmm. make it. Name one. Like I would not bet against any of those 13 lines of business. So where can you get an investment opportunity that is like 13 VC investments that are going to hit? It's unheard of. So then what Sandra, do you guys, do you how think? do you guys answer the people who say that? Yes. Okay. I've heard the same story over and over again. You guys have told me just wait till next quarter. Just wait till uh, this thing comes out. Wait till Cybertruck is launched. And then they're just getting tired. Uh, you know, RoboTaxi is going to come. I've got my own answer to this, but you know, what do you tell to those people who've been patiently waiting and now they're just at their wits end and they're tired? Uh, well, one theory I have is first of all, if Elon didn't buy X Twitter the stock would be a lot higher. Okay. So he turned on a lot of enemies with that acquisition. Second of all, the amount of animosity he gets drives him harder. So consider all of this, animosity and hatred as a catalyst for him to deliver even more and do more. You know, I, that's, that's, that's my thing. But again, I go back, the simple way to explain it to somebody is look at the 13 different businesses, ask somebody which one's going to fail. And then yeah. if they say half, then add up six or seven of them, what they are actually worth, because you know, they're not going to come in second place when they deliver a robot. And I remember on the earnings call, I, uh, I was thinking of you, Alexander, at the time, because I think I was watching you on the earnings call live, and they they talked about delivering the robot next year, Optimus. My head exploded. I was like, what? And I'm watching the stock uh, price. Yeah, and I'm like, know. exactly. <laughs> was I it's dreaming? Like, yeah. yeah. Did, did I really and then, and then they were going on about Dojo, Dojo. He said Dojo won't happen. He never said Dojo will happen. He always said, this is the, you know, the biggest token. If it works, it's brilliant it's going to be billions but if it's not going to work don't count on that and i mean anybody who studies tesla has seen this for four years i actually then took the time to put all the quotes together i actually think they're sandbagging enormously on dojo oh, yeah. I, I published mm -hmm. yesterday evening again 37 new jobs on on that field but even if you would not believe dojo everything else is working right so what do i say to people who say i want to go out now i mean i tell them if you want to go out go out right you you yeah. have you, i can't i cannot tell you to stay you shouldn't listen to me you don't have the time and the patience anymore if you feel better for other stock want to buy nvidia at an all-time high do it you know anybody who 
who has this, you know, has lost this faith or is aggravated or whatever, mm -hmm. stocks is only money. Money is only a part of your life. Money comes and goes, right? If you are unhappy, if you drive yourself uh, in, into insane modes, and if you're aggravated with all that, it's not worth it. Your health is more worth it. Your family life is more worth it. And, and if this is too much to take, it's not a shame to leave. That, that's just that's just it. I wish everybody could stay and everybody has the time to to stay. But this is certainly not something where, you know, we have to be influenced by other people. Everybody has to understand where their pain point is. I'm currently having none. I'm actually very happy because I have new money that I can invest and I'm I'm all happy about it. But if people feel really stressed, it's not worth it. Stock gambling is not worth it. Yeah, yeah the, the 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 quarterly earnings are a ninety day, you know, get on, get off the hamster wheel kind of thing. And the reason the stock didn't move after hours when they talked about the bot is there's no, you know, he says there may be a few of them at the end of next year where they're thinking about what's going to happen in the next ninety days. Well, the next ninety days, you didn't, or then even this year, you didn't tell me how many units you're going to ship. You told me you didn't have a crystal ball regarding gross margins. So these folks run back and they get all mad and they're like, I didn't get any of my questions answered. And then they, they got to go, they got to take their price target down. And you had just had a flood of price target reductions after that call. So, you know, again, you can't, we can't, that call could have been better, but it's done. So the question is, is you have this 90 day hamster wheel that you have to get on and off the earnings call. Obviously Tesla does not like playing that game. When prices were going up, and volumes were going significantly higher per quarter, it was very easy for them to participate in the hamster wheel because gross margins were going up, units were going up, sales were going up, everything. It was a very easy thing, but they were still working on the long term. So what you have is you have this company that, that I think they've built a better long-term portfolio. When I say long-term, I'm talking even two years uh, out. They have a better long-term portfolio than they've ever had before of products. And I believe that they are forward leveraging those products now for COGS reductions. And they're actually using that today. And I think that will play out over this year. Uh, and, and, and I think they're going to surprise, but, but let's see. Um, but anyway, I, I, there's just two different worlds. There's the 90 day, every 90 day world where they got to get up and talk about the business. And then there's what they're building for the next two to 10 years. And you have to figure out what investor you are. If you're the every 90 day investor, it's it's going to be touch and go. They could surprise this quarter, they could not. But they've had a history over the last couple of quarters of, you know, struggling with struggling with the results. I mean, the EPS is lower, but also struggling with how to communicate what they're doing and why they're doing. So you have to figure out which which are you a trader or are you an investor? Before you can win in both, by the way, too. Uh Jeff, you just said something that is very interesting. So you're forward leveraging future products to lower costs. Are you implying that um, they're they're uh, signing contracts with vendors for uh, supply chain parts and then bringing that in? Can you elaborate? Yeah, a thousand percent. So Tesla has a history of, of of building and shipping incrementally higher volume every quarter, every year since it's the inception of the company. And that is a very attractive thing for the supply base because supply base, they, the supply base, they want growth. So if you're in the auto supply chain, ICE plus hybrid is negative growth. So if you're in the United States, in North America, and you're building cars, and there's thousands of suppliers, ICE plus hybrid is negative growth. So whatever you were doing last year, your aggregate growth is probably going to be flat to negative. EV is is going to grow. Any there's estimates as low as twenty five percent, high as forty percent this year. And Tesla is the leader in that. So what Tesla does is they say, "Well, look what we're doing today. We have the products. We have the portfolio. We're the number one selling car. If you get a part award on the Model Y, you get the highest volume part award of any one model, any one car model. Remember, BYD passed Tesla." in total annualized volume, but they do it across 19 to 21 different uh, models, whereas Tesla is doing that on four and mainly two. Two of those four are 95% of the volume. So they have the highest volume today. They'll have the highest volume next quarter per SKU. They'll have the highest volume this whole year, next year. And then they say, 
I'm doing, this is where the forward leveraging comes in. There's near term forward leveraging. And then there's even further out where they say, I'm building a model compact. I've already given you the RFQs. It's going to be probably the entire uh, volume of my entire portfolio, what it is today. If you want to get into that bake off, this is what I need you to do today on model Y and model three cogs. This is what I need from you. I need you to stretch. If you want to get to the next thing, it, they suppliers know if they don't stretch now and to get to that next thing, they're going to die after the model. Y. they're just, they're, they're going to have a huge issue. You're going to have trailing volume. So they're all going to want to get onto that next vehicle. And then of course the bot. So they have the compact and they have the bot. Those are the two main things. And they have the highest volume per SKU auto portfolio. So that's how they're forward leveraging. One of the supply chain VPs talked about that concept on the earnings call. It didn't get picked up by many. Um, Alexandra picked it up. I did, uh, but it didn't get picked up by really anyone. And Jeff, how much capacity would you say there is now with Ford and GM retreating from the EV space? Well, we know the we know the U.S. We so we know U.S. Europe. So we know all three ICE supply chains: U.S., Europe, and China are overcapacitized anywhere from thirty to fifty percent. We know that. We know that from what peak volumes were before COVID versus where they are today. And in terms of EV, we know where that's growing and we know what percent of the pie Tesla gets uh, of that. So that's where suppliers want to invest. That's where you want to put their capital. And they will take more risk, both on the COG side and on the volume side with Tesla. They won't take the risk on the ICE side. So you're going to see more supply, more lumpy, uh, I, I have a supply chain issue. I have the, you're going to hear more of that on ICE because of the fact that these suppliers want to take less and less risk with that because it's not growing. They know it's not. They know if they get a volume award from Tesla, Tesla will very rarely push anything back to them. They'll take everything that they ask for. And that's uh, that's a, a rare thing that's probably happening right now in the in auto. Hmm. And I would like to Sorry. add here, I don't know whether you've seen that yesterday, uh, that LG Chem has signed with GM a $20 billion battery deal uh, for the next, I don't know what it, five years or seven years or whatever it was. So they are planning on EVs. I mean, nobody signs a deal like that if they don't have the commitment to to construct them. They're just so late. And the cars they are making, uh, it's actually funny because in my local Santa Barbara, I read an article yesterday that uh, Town Hall would like to have all the the um, city fleets being electric, but they cannot find because they don't want a Y. They want sort of a minivan type that they, you know, can use to to chauffeur around stuff and, and people and whatever. There's nothing around yet. The bolt is too small for that. They're still missing segments in the EV production that there's clients for today, but there's just nothing out there. So with the Unbox model, with the next generation car, which in my view is going to be two, three, four different models of mm -hmm. you know what's going to be put on it, Tesla will be the breaking breaking into these new segments again. So th they were discussing in that Santa Barbara article, oh, should we buy a Lightning, right? A truck just because that's the size we need because we need to to haul stuff around. The second there is this this van size. There is somebody in this segment. So, so while you know, I'm I'm more cautious on the car segment than I'm on the bots. On the bots, I'm ultra bullish. The car segment is a is always been the most complicated segment in the world in 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 the industries. It's always been usually a seven to eight percent margin business, uh, very cyclical, and uh, and and Tesla has outperformed over years in there. Um, the second we have, we're covering the $25,000 car, we're having the van, we're having a couple of other models that are currently searched for, and I just don't see anybody else going there, even though they're signing big contracts, then they won't be ready. Okay. Yeah. Let's uh, go ahead, Jeff. Just a quick comment. When you hear, like you heard, a lot of people heard about the Ford Skunk Works project, um, when you hear these things and you hear a CEO, even Elon, you're anybody to say like, well, we think, you know, 2026 will have something. That's, that's normally the way they talk is unit number one. And Elon started to change his verbiage on this, 
But when they talk about unit number one, it's going to take them a year, year and a half, two years to not only get their supply chain up to speed, but to get their own factory up to volume. So when they say, when you hear them say 2026, first off, there's going to be high variation on them hitting that, but that's unit number one. That's not, we're at peak scale serving all the markets we need to serve and making money at, at better than break even. Uh, you know, again, just look at the cyber truck. The cyber truck was, you know, released or launched on November, 2023. But in terms of them shipping a cyber truck that makes money at scale, it's probably a year or so after that. Just keep that in yeah, mind. Yeah, uh, Mer Mercedes actually just announced that they're launching right now, available, an e-sprinter van. And then, of course, some of us are wondering, you know, would it be nice if we had a cyber van come out soon? And that's okay. I mean, these vans are out there and they're going to sell very well. And that's a great thing to happen. But All right, let's move on to... It, Sorry, right, real quick. Uh, I was just going to say, you, you know, that that uh, J James brought up the steer by wire and like, you, you know, you got Jeff ex explaining cogs reductions and how that impacts. And like, you know, this is the, the reality is that you have uh, the company is driving down cogs. They're going to launch a vehicle that no one will be able to compete with because they've you know they have been innovating so tesla is pushing the entire industry forward and they're going to be able to you know like you said because launch a robo taxi because uh they're uh they don't have harnesses running from uh you know one side of the vehicle to another they can put it wherever they want and uh and and like i, th I think that this capital allo allocation that they're, that they're doing, it really all just ties in what, what, what you guys are talking about. And, and I just, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about like, like I'm the dumbest one in the room and, and all these smart people are forward looking, right? Everyone's so frustrated and, I, and we will talk about this in a minute, but like, they're so frustrated. They want to sell Tesla here at, at the low and just give up and, and Elon, you know, pol political tweets and all of this, but like realize what we're actually focused in on. It's, it's the details of where they're going, not where they are right now. What's happened to what Xander said, they are already so far ahead. Who can touch? This pricing on a Model Y, which can drive itself. Colorado, 27K. Vermont, 27K. I mean, 30,000. If you compare that and benchmark that to any other vehicle on the road, it is light years ahead. And they're about to take this a lot further. And they still make a profit at these price points. I mean, it's simply untouchable. Yeah. It Reminds me of what Elon did say way many years ago, right? He goes, the only reason why this uh, idea of Tesla can succeed now is because there's two incredible innovations that are happening at the same time. One is the transition from an ice car to electric vehicle drivetrain, but the second one is robotaxi, self-driving. He said if both weren't happening at the same time, then it's possible that the incumbents could possibly catch up and it becomes you know, an, an early lead. That's not what's happening. By the time they catch up on an electric vehicle, the robo taxi will be in place and everything is just dead at that point. I mean, who's going to buy a car that you can't eventually be able to drive uh, on your own? It's just, it's just going to be a completely different market. Everything's changed, completely changed, right? It could be that they stop selling cars altogether to individuals and they own everything and who knows what's going to end up happening. But, um, Okay, let's move on to the stock market. One of the things we'd like to do is after we spoke, uh, discussed uh, Tesla, talk about other stocks that you might be investing in. James, I know that you don't just cover Tesla, and uh, you said that you've been covering NVIDIA for a while as well. What's your thinking about this company? It's been amazing. Um, I picked up a large position. Uh, again, I do a thing called synthetic longs. I sell a put to buy a call. Most risky thing you can possibly ever do in the markets, but... That's what I've been doing for more than nearly two and a half decades. Nice. Um, but uh, it, it's funny because I, I, I got really nervous because the week I bought, the next day, I think it was Kathy Wood sold it. I think the price around 180 or something. And I was in the $200 strikes or $180. I don't remember the exact details a couple of years ago, but I did sell about 80% of my position uh, when it got up to, I think it was around 500 bucks. I decided it's good to 
leave the room, but I kept 20% and it's still mind blowing. Um, so in terms of NVIDIA, you know, I always ask myself, one of the methods I have at the end of every year is I clean shop. I look around, like I was in, I got into a huge position in Meta as well when it fell to 95, 96, like all the stuff went to hell in the hen basket all at the same time. And I look around and I ask myself at the end of every year, would I buy this asset now? And the answer is nope. <laughs> And I know how good it is, but when I compare it to other things, like what exactly do NVIDIA do? Yeah, they got software, they design hardware, but they don't really build anything per se. And they're a one trick pony. And the other concern I have with NVIDIA, not dinging it, I still hold it, I'm still, you know, riding it as much as I can. But you look at the top four buyers of silicon from NVIDIA, they're all building their own silicon right now as we speak. It's only a matter of time before they catch up. And then that'll be a dark day for NVIDIA. If the other four can pull it off, we shall see. I'd like your thoughts on that. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to jump in because I think that, okay, so it's not a one-trick pony. I think that it's, uh, you know, they're, they're headed towards not the valuation is The valuation is on the one-trick right now. Yeah, absolutely true. I mean, yeah. it's it's funny. It's like, it's how people look at Tesla. It's an auto company. Well, NVIDIA is a chip and hardware company, and that is what they are. And like you say, there's competitors coming in, and that's true. But NVIDIA is getting into biotech. They've got an autonomous uh, writing uh, you know, program. They just announced partnerships with 12 robot companies to be able to uh, give it the intelligence, or at least the platform by which these uh, companies can then build their AI uh, you know, environment on. So it's almost like the way I saw, I see t uh, NVIDIA's future is that it's going to try to become a Tesla <laughs> while Tesla trying to become NVIDIA in terms of their dojo computer, right? Like some pieces of their of their organization. So I, I think NVIDIA's future is still wide open for them and they'll use the money that they're making on the chips to fund these other innovations. Yeah. So the question is, you know, are they an innovative company? Can they produce beyond this? And I don't know. I mean, we think that Jensen is an amazing uh, CEO. People think that he's one of the better CEO, better CEO than Elon, which is mind blowing to me because he's not proven it. He basically did the gaming chip, and then it turned out to be the perfect, you know, graphic chip for AI. And he rode the wave. Now, if he can then take that uh, business unit and, and add on these other business units that then become very successful, my hats out to him at that point. Right now. I still regard Elon as the the the, the leader in this whole thing. Uh, yeah, that's uh, my comment on that. And the question, you know, you mentioned it perfectly. He was in the right place at the right time. Timing was impeccable. Was that planned or was that luck or was it a combination? And that's what you need to look at too. Mm. But if you look at Elon Musk's track record, there's no luck there. I believe everything was a plan, step by step. And he thinks seven to 10 years ahead. So yeah. I would... I would, uh, if you've studied like what NVIDIA has been doing since, you know, 2015, I mean, he's been talking about uh, training AI, uh, large models and management of it. I don't, I don't think there's a tremendous amount of luck actually in the NVIDIA story. Um, and I think they've got a fairly significant lead. Uh, remember when companies say that they're going to to do something, they're going to get to chip number one, you know, they call it kind of like tape out. Uh, and to get to the kind of scale that they're at, they about NVIDIA doesn't have their own fabs, but they're at scale from uh, many different perspectives. The number of product lines they serve, their CUDA software platform, these are things that other companies don't have and it will take them a very long time to ramp up to. Now, where I would give Tesla an advantage and when it comes to this inference chip, this chip that doesn't need all the bells and whistles, but is is used in AI, Tesla has the end-to-end -end solution of they have they have it all the way, you know, the whole system integration all the way down to the customer level, all the way back up to doing silicon hardware design and software design. They have that advantage. But in terms of NVIDIA, I mean, I've been invested in this name. It's it's a it top five in my holdings, and I've traded it over a number of years. Um and um, I, I actually think that they've got a fairly strong runway ahead of them. Yes, everybody's working on doing their own thing because NVIDIA is charging 75 points of, of gross margin uh, to get in this game. They've got 52 weeks of lead time, unheard of in, in silicon. And 
what that means is they have control of the whole marketplace. This is why I go back to this, looking at it from supply. When they get on the earnings call, they have visibility, they have order book visibility going out a year. And for mo- for many of their uh, customers, they are probably doing take or pay agreements with them. Everybody's worried about over, over uh, double booking. You know, there could be some people ordering stuff in advance of what they actually need to install it in their network infrastructure. That could be happening. But the, the, the thing about double booking, no. I mean, when you're on global allocation and the whole world wants your product and more than you can make, they can go into take or pay mode where it's like, look, you asked for 10,000 of these in this quarter. If you don't take them, you're paying me for $10,000 worth of each 10,000 units worth of H200s. And they'll have to, uh, that's how the contracts are written. Um, so again, this is me. I don't know for a fact, but in my experience, and I've done, I have bought silicon from NVIDIA in a part, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they're on that. So they're in the driver's seat in so many different aspects, their supply chain, their software platform, which people don't talk about, and their product lineup. Yes, AMD is coming out with a solution. Uh, and yes, um, uh, Microsoft, everybody's kind of working on their own solutions or have some that are already in in production. Google has their own Tensor chip you know, in production, their own inference chip. Tesla has their own chip in production. So you have this dynamic happening, but you have this massive demand that they still have to um, they still have to to serve over the next like, fairly long period of time. So the question about Nvidia, so they have earnings in two weeks. One of the things to think about is like they've been beating and raising, and the size of that raise is probably what's going to be in question. And if it's not as big as ever everybody thought the the beaten raise is going to be, then then maybe you know you you saw it sell off last quarter um, on that. And you saw it sell off on some of the China news, which I knew that they were going to figure out probably in three to six months, which they are. So it'll be a tricky thing here. Um, I don't have any you know direct advice, but if you you know you've made a lot of money, you can decide what percentage to keep, what percent percent to keep you know to let go. But it's it's a fantastic company, fantastic leadership, um, and you know there's competition coming. You have to keep your eyes open on that. But I think they're in a good they're they're in a good place. And I totally agree with you, Jeff. I wasn't dinging the company by no stretch. If I if I was, I wouldn't be holding it. But yeah. at the same time, um, you know, it's up against some formidable players, and it does have that integrated hardware software stack, which is a huge edge. And of course, demand out the wazoo, as far as the eye can see. As, as, as Elon says, demand off the hook. Demand off the hook. Yep, yeah, and it'll probably continue. So, what do you guys think? Uh, go around the panel here, just for fun. It's six ninety six right now. If all time high was 707, do people think it's going to get to a thousand, uh, or is it going to start falling from here? Where are you? Where's your heads? And again, this is just for fun, not financial advice. We have no idea, nobody here knows what's going to happen, but it's just for fun. What do you think? What's Sandra? the time what horizon? With that? Oh, yeah, good. Um, with me. I, I'd say let's let's give it, uh, I would say in the next by the end of this year. Yeah, what's going to happen by the end of the year? That's good. It's February. What do you think, Jeff? What's your prediction? Yeah, I, I want to know what these experts think. No, I'm Nobody's an here expert. an expert. Nobody here's an expert on this. <laughs> That's the whole point, right? You're not. Who knows what you can predict with stock price? I, I could see eight hundred to nine hundred by the end of the year. Yeah, yeah. For me, it's like I'm looking at AI, right? An AI boom, and we saw it skyrocket last year. And then some people are going, you know, I, I I think Larry Goldberg is saying this is as classic. What happens is the hype train. So this AI hype train goes up. Then there's always the trough of disappointment. And then the actual ability of that technology kicks in and then it goes up again and then it skyrockets at that point. But that's sort of this typical pattern. He thinks that we're now at the pattern where this is just a, you know, a hype train. It's going to go down again. I, I disagree. I think it, this is different. This AI boom is one of those things that is actually impacting employees and productivity now. It started happening last year. People are starting to let go of employees because they don't need to because they're, everybody's using the AI tools, the large language models to actually supplement their jobs. It, it spread so quickly to the world. Like I don't know what percentage of people are using it, 
but it was the number, it was a, the one that it's like, I think distinction is a product that was released that is so much faster adoption by the world than all the others, like much quicker than everyone else. I think this is different. This is an actual tool that helps people become productive, that impacts earnings, that impacts businesses' capabilities, and it's an actual tool that they're able to use, as opposed to hype, you know, that it's overhyped. I think the e-commerce and internet boom was when people, st startups start to throw money, but, you know, they hadn't built websites, they hadn't built the infrastructure, the, the, you know, pets.com weren't able to deliver you the products yet, that that was a boom, that the, it turned into a bust. So I think it's still on its uh, uh, trajectory up. Uh, what, what do you guys think? Yeah, I don't think people uh, that are buying at all time highs are thinking about um, what the company will do by the end of the year. I think they're wondering what the company is going to do by earnings calls in two weeks. And can I make a quick buck? Because, you know, Tom Lee mm. is telling me that the macro is going to, you know, in February is like, I think, the third worst month of the year. And and so you, you know, unfortunately, this is this actually does go to exactly what you were saying, Herbert, uh, regarding you know, it, it, right now it's the hype cycle. Then people are gonna uh, evaluate the actual company. Do do they know all these things that that, that Jeff and James know about, about the company that you know about it? Um, you, you know, I'm I'm if you're not tracking Nvidia and you're not looking at um, fun, it, it as a fundamental business. Uh, unfortunately, that's where I, you know, I'm very cautious. Um, maybe I'll play a, a, a quick play. I did uh, for twenty, you know, for less than twenty four hours, and bought Nvidia Leap at uh, uh, four ninety, and then sold it the next day for a four hundred dollar profit. Woohoo! But if if I just held it right, if I had conviction in the company, I would have held on to that and just rode this whole thing up. Um, but th so I, I think there's a lot of psychology that's going to come into play in the really really short term. So I, you know I think it's really important to uh, look at the look at the fundamentals. And if you're if you're going to try to gamble, um, you know can it can it go to uh, 800 or 900 or set you know 750? We're, we're at 700. I think it's really really important to look at the options market of this because there's a thing called uh delta hedging right and gamma squeezes that occur and the more options that people buy uh you know short term the market makers who are delta neutral they have to buy the shares uh to you know to have uh, the delivery of uh, you know if the calls uh are uh, if the shares are assigned so like that th th that little mechanism is really really important to understand that there could be a big sell-off if the news is bad or if they don't guide um so just be prepared for that uh is is what i'd like to say okay from a if you want a, a technicals perspective i can share a couple of pictures too mm -hmm. Um, Please. So first of all, let's look at this first one here. This is the one I showed earlier. The trend mm -hmm. is still up. That's the big blue pipe. It shows no sign of slowing down. But more importantly, uh, we have this thing called the Lilo model. It's designed to identify layers of support and resistance. We are at layer seven right now, and that's exactly at 703, where it will struggle. But if it breaks through that level, we could go straight to layer level nine which is 905 bucks and uh level 10 is the total total extremely overbought thousand and thirty dollars these are feasible if they continue to execute and they still continue to blow away expectations but that has to stall at some stage and i want to make sure that when that does turn around when you see the blue fat line turn around time to get off the train or hedge and uh leave so the question is, it's been an amazing ride, but nothing lasts forever. And yeah. there's also that issue I mentioned too, the rotation from the money runners, they'll be looking for the next AI play. The question is, when can Tesla and Elon convince Wall Street and the analysts that this is the next AI play? When that happens, then you're gonna see the same, same pattern chart like that and the question is can people rotate to be back on the train or will we have our bottom sellers here and then <laughs> they'll become top buyers over time and that's just the way markets work mm -hmm. 
See, yeah. that's why I, when you ask me what's your time frame, my time frame is like a, you know, the end of the year, not this quarter, not this next quarter. I look at it from the business perspective. Is this going to be an innovative, disruptive technology that's going to continue to grow for many, many years to come? That's the kind of company I want to hold. And yeah. yes, it's going to fall. It's going to, it can't continue to keep rising. It's always going to rise. And then there's this, you know, take a breather. But then does it then keep going back up again if sales continue to happen? How big is this market? And uh, like you said, competitors, is it, can they truly be competitors? And Jeff is explaining that it's not as easy as just coming up with another chip that they're all trying to, you know, wind out. Um, and then, yeah, is the market, like how big is this market? And when it comes to AI, it's sure, it's hard to get, it's hard to measure, but it sure feels like uh, it's a lot bigger than we think. And Jeff hit the nail on the head too, and he said they now have the capital to invest and hedge their whole mm -hmm. business. You know, with they made what three hundred billion dollars of market cap in the first ten trading days of the year, and to go from where we are now seven hundred to a thousand, that's only a forty percent jump, which it did in the beginning of this year already. So towards the end of the year, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that we get to a thousand bucks. Which is insane to even think about, but that would, whether it be two point something trillion market cap. Yeah, yeah. At one point. I was going to say you're at one point seven two at this moment. So yeah. forty percent of of that is a big number. Yeah. So, but you know, we've seen crazier things happen, and and then we are in the midst, literally, the very early infancy of the AI revolution. So, well, I'm going to ask you, James. Expanded. Yeah, been asking everybody this question. I want to ask you: When does a when does Tesla be given the AI bump? When is it people going to think that they're an AI company? I think when an FSD is nailed or the bot is doing stuff. When Wall Street analysts can see the bot actually replacing labor in factories, then the penny will drop within Wall Street. In the meantime, retail investors get to jump on the bus early. So. Jeff, what do you think? Are you, What's it? Are, are you saying uh, the penny will drop or the panties will drop? <laughs> the penny. <laughs> it's a, I think it's an old English expression for uh -huh, both, the aha both. moment. If you, if, you wear, if you wear panties, Xander, they may drop. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I, I agree with I agree with this. This could be a whole show in itself. I mean, I, I shared a Microsoft. Microsoft has an, an, an AI co-pilot commercial on X. Uh, today I shared it on my timeline. It's just refreshing to see commercials that are about AI and AI experiences uh, outside of the bubble, the Tesla bubble. I mean, when I show people the yoke in my car and the car in FSD beta, people have never seen it before. 99% of people haven't seen it before and it just blows them away. So I think there's an issue of awareness. I think I think even in, in Wall Street, they don't understand the capability of Tesla's real-world AI solution and just the whole swath of language models. So when is it going to get that AI um, recognition? I think when there's some meaningful print, you know, from an EPS perspective and or there's a, an amazing demo that says, by the way, you see these bots replacing labor and there's 10,000 coming in the next quarter. And then you're going to see some massive run uh, on it. But until then... Uh, you know, Tesla's not telling the story outside of some of the things that they're, you know, they're doing sporadically. Uh, and other companies are spending their ad dollars. They're, they're talking about it on their earnings call. They're talking about how it's converting to real uh, bottom line EPS. And, and then, of course, NVIDIA is actually printing it. Microsoft's just about to start printing it now with Copilot. So it, it show, it show me the money. Exactly. Right. Thank you so much, James. That was a lot of fun. You're amazing. I love that you you come with uh, charts and financial models. Uh, we've covered that in our last interview, but uh, to get your perspective and what's happening great with stuff. Tesla was great. And thank you very we much. Should, we, we should. Uh, I'd love to do it again, and for us of course. all to collaborate on that. Yeah. And uh, you know, if we could all imagine meeting of the minds, and we all agree with PE ratios yeah. and sales yeah. growth and ASPs and all these different types of things, and I think, I, I guess my my job is to try and help investors get into disruptive assets early so they can make yep. a change to their lives and not be stuck in 60-40 portfolios that'll go nowhere over time, especially with the monetary debasement, which is horrific, by the way. Um, but yeah, uh, anytime. Thank Love you, you so guys. Much, James.
Thanks, Thanks James. To be here. Bye-bye. Thank you. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.